Good evening and welcome to The Probe. Well, since the days of Nkrumah, Ghana's democracy has been under attack from actors within and those actors elsewhere who arduously work to ensure that this form of governance suffered some form of miscarriage of a sort. In an era where the very foundations of democratic governance are weakening year after year in the sub-Saharan region of Africa, a conversation about how to assess our risks, vulnerability, threats, and our capacity to remain at unflinching as a sovereign democratic state is timely. It's certainly time for us to take our security a bit more seriously. I'm talking about your personal security and that of our dear country. So tonight at this table, we have assembled some of the brightest brains to probe this issue intensely and understand how to counter the ever-present threat of violent extremism in Ghana, West Africa, and the world as we know it. Tonight on The Probe, do feel free to contribute as well via all our social media platforms because we are live on YouTube, we are live on Facebook, on Twitter. Also on WhatsApp, you can send your messages. As always, The Probe is live on the Joy News channel. We are on DSTV channel 421. Go TV channel is 144. On Joy 99.7 FM on your radio, we are also live together with over 30 affiliates across Ghana's 16 regions. Also live on myjoyonline.com, Spotify, and other social media platforms. Welcome once again to The Probe. I am MFA Apau, and when we return, I'll introduce my guest to you. I have the Deputy Defence Minister, Kofi Amankwame, who joining us via Zoom. Also, Dr. Vladimir Enchidanso. He's a Dean, Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College. Joining me in the studios, also via Zoom, is Mukhtar Mumuni Mukhtar, Executive Director, West Africa Centre for Counter Extremism. It's a packed show tonight. Get ready, and let's talk about our security as a country. Do stay with me. I'll be right back. Welcome back. Tonight, uh, we're here live on The Probe. So uh, tonight, like I said, uh, let's, let me just uh, state that it is not to press the panic buttons, like many of you are thinking. It's just a, a call for extra vigilance, a call for us uh, to act more and be looking out uh, for such counter-extremism and also threat attacks uh, to our country. That's what we are looking at today, so that um, the Famanyami attitude that we have as a country, we can put it aside a bit more and stay vigilant. So uh, let me welcome once again my guest uh, to tonight's show. Uh, Mr. Kofi Amankwa is a Deputy Defence Minister and MP for Ichima Kwauma. Uh, Dr. Vladimir Enchidansu is me, was with me in the studio. He's the Dean, Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College. Also Mukta Mumuni Mukta, Executive Director, West Africa Centre for Counter Extremism. Along the line also, I'll be joined on uh, via Zoom by Peter Lanchini Tobu. He is a member of the Defence and Interior Committee of Parliament so that we can have his input as well. Thank you very much, gentlemen, uh, for joining us here tonight on the program. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe it's just appropriate for me to start with the Deputy Defence Minister uh, who is joining us via Zoom, Mr. Kofi Amankwamenu. We've cited a number of memos this week, at least starting with the Gota boys. We know they've been moved from the port. We are told it's for this particular reason, terrorism attack, and it's a potential threat to the country. And then also we've seen that memo to churches as well. What exactly is our situation when it comes to terror attack in the country? If you can unmute, sir. Hello, Mr. Mankwa. Okay. It appears we're unable to hear him just yet, but we'll, we'll work on that. Uh, so it's appropriate to me, for me to just come into the studio then, uh, since uh, we are sure that we can hear you. Dr. Enchidansu, thank you so much uh, for joining us You're in the studios welcome. once again. Thank you for, thank you so, for having um, me. You, uh, many of you don't know that um, Dr. Enchidansu is an elder in church. He's been in <laughs> church the whole day uh, after, you know, church. So how real is the threat? Is the church taking it seriously? Um, do we have that memo to all the churches and how and were we reacting to it today? Well, I think the churches are taking terrorism in Ghana very seriously. Mm -hmm. In my own church, that's the President Church of Ghana, uh, we are not relenting in our effort to at least make sure that terrorism is mainstreamed, mm -hmm. that our, our uh, members 
are able to understand what terrorism means and what the implications are. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly, we have instances where we have this joint kind of education between Muslim communities and the Christian communities. And I have been particularly part of it. Okay. That we go from church to church, mosque to mosque, to at least let them be aware of the essence of peaceful coexistence and the need not to be part of any extremist organization. Uh, I have been invited to some other churches also. The Methodist Church had invited me before the President Church headquarters, and we have been trying at least to make our members understand what terrorism is. You know, being aware of our security environment is 90% of the problem solved. Okay. You would remember your outfit uh, tried a certain kind of knowledge awareness mm -hmm. at, the, at the Accra Mall. And you know the result. It was clear that people were oblivious to the dangers around them. And this is not good for a country. You see, terrorism works best when they know that the people are unaware of their surrounding, that they are oblivious to the dangers of terrorism. I can assure you that terrorism doesn't wear a flag. The guy who was arrested in Lagos some time ago, he's a Christian. He doesn't belong to any terrorist organization, but he was used. Mm -hmm. He was definitely used when he didn't know what, what was happening. I mean, he's a vendor. And people would come around and buy almost all his papers every day and ask him to bring more. So they, they became friends. Next time, they were sending him to dep deposit some parcels at some places, apparently including bombs. And that's how he was arrested. And he, he even didn't know that he was working for terrorists. These, uh, this awareness, for example, if he were aware about the presence of terrorists uh, in camouflage, he would have been very much more careful about how to deal with people like that. Mm -hmm. Or the very fact that somebody comes and buys your newspaper that you are selling. You have 3,000 and he buys all the 3,000. Bring me 5,000 the following day and he, he buys them. You mm -hmm. think you are making money. Yeah. But you should be thinking beyond that. Over here in Ghana, we are not very much aware of terrorism at all. And that's, that's the source of worry. And, and I it, see that a number of questions that we have will definitely get into what we need to look out for, exactly. uh, what the signs are in terms of uh, what you should pick up when it comes to these uh, terror attacks. But let me try on Zoom again yeah. and see if um, my guests on Zoom can hear me now and can be heard as well. Mr. Uh, Kofiamankwa, it looks like you can hear me now and uh, maybe let's, let's hear you. I can hear you. Super. That's great. I can hear you. Welcome once and again. I, 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 I hear the question, your, your, your question. Mm -hmm. The question you posed to me about a memo circulating uh, about national security uh, getting some guys out of the harbor and the other places. Yes, this, this is one thing an exercise national security undertook. And it is all a, in a way to get, you know, a harbor clear of, 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 of people who are not supposed to be there. This really will give the, the, the security agencies, you know, the room to really see what is going on, what people are doing, who, who uh, is supposed to be there so that they can effectively monitor the activities of every Tom, Dick and Harry, you know, either transacting business at uh, the harbor or otherwise. So yes, all these things are done because uh, the issue of terrorism, it's, it's something which we, we have to, uh, as a country, take seriously. Because if you look at the activities of, of, of these armed um, groupings or uh, extremists, they are fast moving southwards. Not too long ago, just uh, I think uh, on the 11th of April thereabout, or uh, yes, there was, uh, Togo was hit. Mm -hmm. And that was serious. If, if you look at the, the modus operandi of these um uh, groupings, they are now coming up with sophisticated uh, ways of doing things. And so we cannot sit and fold our arms thinking that all is well, all is not well. And so we need to prepare. We need to be vigilant. We need to really, like we say in Ghana, shine our eyes the more. Because if you look around all the countries around Ghana, in one way or the other have been hit. We are the only country left standing. If I say the only country left standing, talk of Burkina, they've been hit. Talk of Togo, Benin, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, 
they've all experienced this bitter appeal from these uh, extremists. And when you look at the, the, the southward movement of the Scorpions, clearly one thing is obvious. They are looking to find a coastal country. And so Benin, Togo, and then Cote d'Ivoire. Mm. And so we in Ghana must begin to, like I said, shine our eyes and then really uh, 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 try to fight this, this, this crime. I call it a crime. Of course, it is a crime. Because when you have people killing, maiming, and, and destroying properties, definitely that is a crime. And so, yes, the security agencies are really preparing the ground so that they can have the room to really uh, operate effectively. And so, yes, that, that is uh, the, the, the memo you, you are talking about. Okay. Well, there are questions about these Gota boys, so to speak, that you're moving from the harbor uh, to be able to do this kind of um, operation, how prepared they are, how resourced they are to be able to do it, are some of the questions I've seen. We'll get into the audience questions shortly, but uh, the issue about Ghana being the only country standing in the middle when it comes to these attacks, we know that Mukhtar Mumuni uh, Mukhtar raised that in his uh, recent report. Uh, Dr. Mjidansu raised concerns about part of that report, but Mukhtar is with us on it. How rife, really, uh, is this situation when it comes to terror attacks on Ghana? You've been looking at this whole situation. Dr. Mjidansu will also make inputs on that. Mukhtar, let me bring you in on this. Hello, good evening to you, and good evening to your listeners and viewers. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so just a few days ago, we released a very recent report on Ghana's exposure to violent extremism. Mm -hmm. This report looked at the country's exposure, both from internal and external sources. And we've been looking at the trajectory of violent extremism within the West African space since 2014, 2015. And what we had observed had been that there is a subword movement of terrorism, violent extremism, and to a point, a large extent, eastward. So it's not a linear movement, but it's largely towards the south. And so we've been seeing and observing the threat of violent extremism descending towards coastal states. And so at the peak of violence around 2015, 2014, over 7,200 fatalities were recorded within this space. And we had just about three, four countries experiencing violent extremism. Today, we are having 53% of all West African states currently experiencing this insurgency. And as our uh, the Deputy Minister rightly pointed out, we are the only country that is yet to experience attacks in the last six years, we've seen, you know, terrorism descending and taking over Burkina Faso, the northern Burkina Faso, same way the northern borders of Benin, Togo, and Cote d'Ivoire. And so what we are seeing also is a very pervasive phenomenon of what we call the spillover. The spillover phenomenon uh, from, you know, the Sahel towards coastal states. And that is why our focus has been in the last couple of years more on the borders or the border communities of our country. Uh, there's a feature of, you know, several vulnerabilities. When you look within, in terms of the internal sources, if you look at the report, we, we highlighted key vulnerability spots and key vulnerability factors. Mm -hmm. There's a mention of chieftaincy as a pervasive phenomenon that can be exploited and weaponized by extremist groups. And this is very, it's a very unique feature of extremist violence in this space. Uh, if you look at the over 352 unresolved chieftaincy conflicts, it tells you how pervasive this is. And if you want to analyze it further in terms of its linkage with violent extremism, there's the document, a very recent report by the Global Terrorism Index for 2020, 2021 that reveals that over 97% of all terrorism <coughs> fatalities during that space happened in countries that are already in conflict. Okay. And so you would see the very pervasive incidences and feature of West Africa within the Sahel and also Afghanistan. It tells you 
that if you have unresolved conflicts within your space, there is a tendency that extremist groups would exploit this, either to recruit vulnerable individuals, to engage in attacks, or both. And so that's why we highlighted you know, in the report that governments need to do more, mm. to do everything possible to you know, quickly resolve the unresolved conflicts we are currently dealing with. Okay, so but largely yeah. we've been told that these are conflicts that are under control, have been contained. So the concern is how they are able to spill over such that we can get uh, these um, terror attacks as a result of these ones are some of the things that we'll be interrogating because we'll have to bring in uh, the audience questions as well. But let me quickly uh, bring in uh, Peter Lanchini Tobu because I've been monitoring your status today and I see that you have concerns about this particular memo to churches and, of course, mosques as well, public places of worship amongst others in terms of this particular memo. What really is the concern for you when we come to that? Thank you very much, uh, Amifa. Let me also say good evening to uh, Professor Antidansu, my brother Mukhtar, and then the Deputy Minister. Um, I have read the statement from the National Security Ministry, and I do know that when we are talking about terrorism, either you look at it from the global perspective or you look at it from the national perspective. If you are looking at it from the national perspective, you can gradually begin to think about the internal threats and the external threats. If you are looking at the internal threat and you are trying to bring in churches, the question I was asking was, the memo that directed them to try to see if they can get some CCTV cameras or some private security to be able to, to, to contain a possible attack. I was, I was saying, I think that is not enough. Mm -hmm. We expect that the government will ensure people will appreciate and be conscious enough of the reality of threats. Every nation faces threats. So the fact that we are facing a threat is not new. But what are we doing in terms of developing our national resilience to be able to cope with it if it happens? So I want imams and pastors to be conscious enough and be able to preach accordingly. They're able to build their sermons in line with the fact that every individual in this country, be you a Muslim or a Christian, should be conscious of the possibility of an attack. And probably that this can inform the way we worship. This can inform the way we gather. This informed the way we see strangers in our churches and our more. Gradually, the whole country will be conscious enough to appreciate the fact that we are fighting this canker as a nation. If you look at the global perspective, if they're trying to have access to coastal areas or access to the sea, and you're talking about Cote d'Ivoire, you're talking about Togo, you're talking about Benin, the truth of the matter, we need to look at it as a regional body. Mm. The regional perspective will help us be able to, to build some defense against them moving southward and having access to the sea. But if you are looking at it as a country alone, we cannot survive in isolation. Okay. Well, let's then uh, get into the audience questions. Otherwise, we're leaving them out on this. National resilience is one of the issues that have come up. But once we get into the questions, all the other um, issues would get to be answered. So let's quickly get into it, Yao. If you're ready, let's start with um, this one on Facebook. This one from Robert. How real are the threats of terrorism for Ghana? Of course, we have seen a few in neighboring countries. But are we really ripe for one? That's Robert's question. Uh, Mohammed says, given how porous our borders are, can we stop any group that wants to cause harm to our country and our people? That's Mohammed's question. Uh, Samuel says, what is the government's briefing on the real likelihood that there will be extremist groups destabilizing our peace? Jack says, youth unemployment has been cited as a major causal factor in some of these cases. We know our situation isn't that good. What are we doing to keep our youth busy? AC says, does Ghana have the capabilities in terms of military awareness, personnel, and equipment to foil such attacks, if any? Uh, that's uh, the first batch of questions. I know we have a number of them, so we'll run through them. So um, let's start from you, Dr. Intridanso. Uh, I see that you've been nodding all through. The issue about national resilience has come up. Uh, the question about how real the threat of terrorism for Ghana uh, has come up. That's uh, a few of the questions that we, we've gone through. You've heard the questions. Let's hear your thoughts on them. Well, generally speaking, terrorism is real everywhere and anywhere. Mm. Um, my colleagues mentioned 2014, 2015. These were the heightened years of terrorism all over the world when a lot of atrocities were committed. And if you watch 70% of all terrorist attacks in Africa happens within the West African sub-region, and that shows that it's real. Mm. More so, 
if, if you research into terrorism activ terrorist activities, you see that the downward trend that we're talking about is real. Quite recently, as the minister said, there had been attacks in Togo, especially the tri-border areas. In mm -hmm. Ghana, tri-border means uh, an area where two, three, three countries meet. Okay. So we have, uh, the trend is coming down from Burkina Faso very seriously. I think the last time they attacked, it was some few kilometers away from our borders in the north. The government has tried to put FOBs, that is, forward operative uh, uh, battalions. But that is not enough. No terrorist comes with a flag mm. uh, entering a border. And people talk about the porosity of our border. There's no country which has no porous borders, even the USA. You can't wall your borders throughout. The only thing is that if you have ungoverned spaces, spaces where government is not felt, where there is nothing government going on, where the inhabitants are the ones who are ruling themselves, then terrorists find ways of being part of the governance system over there. Boko Haram sprang up just because of such a system, that ungoverned spaces in Mali is the same. So yes, porosity of our borders, they are real, but then that will not be a way why terrorism will come to Ghana. Okay. It is only a way where terrorists can, can settle, especially when there are conflict areas over there. My brother from the uh, WCC mm -hmm. mentioned it, that obviously, if you allow such spaces, they settle in there. And in Ghana, if we don't allow such, see, we take preventive measures instead of trying to say that we have a battalion waiting. Mm -hmm. Who says that they will come through where the battalion is? I mean, they try to get a fertile ground. In Ghana, I've been preaching against or preaching on the question of ungoverned un spaces. And one is uh, dollar power. Yeah. If people know what we talk about, dollar power. But if we allow this uh, uh, indiscriminate use of force over there by the people who have occupied the place to continue, Terrorist organizations will find space there and settle there. And again, as uh, uh, one of my colleagues said, you know, where there, is, there are disputes, unresolved historical differences, communal differences, when they are unresolved, the terrorists can find place and find friends amongst them and they can settle. Mm -hmm. So we must make sure that most of these conflicts that dot our, our, our landscape, especially my research shows that there are 74 unresolved hotspots in Ghana. And he talks about 350 chieftaincy disputes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are chieftaincy, but when you put the typology of conflict, unresolved conflicts, we have about 74 strong ones which have defied uh, uh, whatever. If terrorists get friends from those places, they'll come and settle. So it's like we must make sure that we don't leave any space ungoverned. And these hotspots, are we doing anything really about it? Well, really? Uh, government upon government have been able to manage, not resolve them. Okay. You know? Uh, at times, we see them being brought together, chiefs shaking hands. That's not resolution of the problem. Uh, talk of uh, Alavanyo and Konya, mm -hmm. see the chiefs brought together, see if oh, we have now, and uh, Dagbon, we see a little peace in Dagbon, but that's not, the, 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 this is that, it's not resolved. Nanumba Kokomba, it's not resolved. Uh, Boku, Boku, it's not resolved. These are hot peki, you know, these are hot spots where if the com conflict is, in, uh, what we call it, intractable, and they get support, people will get in. Okay. Again, the question about government, uh, what? Prepared, well, yeah. Preparedness. Mm -hmm. There's no way in the world where you can tell me from where I sit that any government in the way is so prepared that there can't be terrorism. Because when they come, there's no flag. As we're talking about the churches and the memo that has gone around, the memo is very, very important. But the basic thing is that look at the Colombo bombing. The guy who entered with the Havasak at the back was touching babies, a nice person you know, touching them and, you know, saying hello, making sure that the BBs even accept them, mm -hmm. accept him as a good person. Then he went and left the Havasak quietly somewhere and went somewhere and detonated the killing people in the church. These are the things, once I was in a church and I teased them a little, when, uh, they had to finish before I preached to them about terrorism. Mm -hmm. And you know what? When the pastor asked them to close their eyes, to, to, to buy down their eyes for prayer, Everybody closed their eyes. So when it was my turn, I said, how many of you close your eyes when the pastor said, let's pray? And everybody raised their hands. And I said, yes, at that point, a terrorist can do whatever he wanted to do. You've got to be vigilant. <laughs> the man said, let's pray. 
He didn't say close your eyes. And everybody had closed their eyes very deeply. And yeah, I said, you eyes. know, exactly. Okay. <laughs> because we feel God will do the rest for us. Yeah. You know, these are some of the things. Simple, okay. simple awareness. Well, let me bring in uh, Mr. Kofi Amankwa being there on, because there's some questions also on government. Uh, the, the briefing that you are getting on the real likelihood that there will be extremist groups destabilizing our peace, uh, for which reason we are taking all these measures. And uh, I see a question from Eric also asking about the implementation of the national security strategy. Maybe we can box it together and then we can take that one, Mr. Meno. Interesting the way uh, Prof ended with, with the church <laughs> thing. I think we, we were brought up believing that yeah, when, when you have to you close are, your eyes to pray. Praying, you have to close your eyes so you can really you know, see the face of the Lord. That mm -hmm. is how we were brought up to learn. But I mean, if I would like to give you a little statistics for people to know how close this, 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 uh, issue of uh, the extremist attacks as, as, as getting closer. In the month of April 2022, I am talking of just last month, there were about 48 terrorist attacks or terror-related incidents reported in the West African sub-region. And I would like to give you the breakdown. In fact, as a result of these attacks, we had about 323 people uh, being killed and then 193 being injured. I want to give you the breakdown in the various countries. If you take Burkina Faso, which top the chart, they had 22 incidents of uh, terrorist attacks or terror-related attacks, out of which 74 people were killed and then 75 people injured. We share border with Burkina Faso. Mm -hmm. You come to Mali. Mali had 13 incidents of attacks, 26 people killed, and then 25 injured. You come to Nigeria, eight attacks, 198 people killed, and then 68 people injured. You come to Benin, and then Togo, one uh, killed eight, and then injured 14. These are countries we deal with. For instance, you take uh, Togo. I mean, for the very first time I went to Togo, I did not go through the main border. I went by a footpath to get to Togo. That shows you how porous our borders are. And so if you have all these neighboring countries experiencing this, this, this uh, uh, heinous crime from these groupies, you know, it is so easy for people to enter and go. They will come in anytime and do whatever they want to do. Prof mentioned the issue of, of the forward operating bases, the FOBs. Currently, government is constructing 15 of them across the northern uh, borders of our country because we have realized or intelligence have shown that most of these activities is coming from the Sahelian regions, Burkina, because if you, if you look at what happened in Togo, this, uh, the, the group that undertook this, this, this act, uh, act where the, is it the Jini, J-N-I-N, yes. these are the uh, Jamaat, Nusrat, Al-Islam, Al-Muslami. Mm -hmm. This is the group that come and they come from Burkina. And so we are having to experience that most of these activities or most of these groupings uh, mm -hmm. engaging in this activity are coming from Burkina. Here we have a porous border. Mm -hmm. It is, I agree with, with Prof that yes, we cannot, you know, build walls around our country. We simply cannot do that. But what is it that we can do? I am aware that government is spending a lot of resources into acquiring all whatever we will need to really uh, uh, resource our security agencies. The, the, the intelligence agencies are being resourced, the armed forces being resourced, the police, immigration. It is, it is a collective. One thing really, MFI, I want to talk about, and that is the reason why, you know, we are kind of uh, reaching out to the churches, the mosque, and all that to be vigilant. These uh, activities are normally undertaken in areas where we have, you know, 
uh, a population. lot of people mm -hmm. coming together to undertake whether uh, church or whatever it is. That is where this crime, because really, if they go to kill just a person, well, nobody will wish that a Ghanaian will lose the life by, by, by you know, some of these activities. But I don't think they will come and then just kill a person or, or, or two. They will not really get the traction they want. And so the they, 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 they activities are concentrated in areas where we have people coming together to undertake. And so, yes, you have to kind of talk to, you know, reach out to, to such areas such as uh, churches and mosques. Well, oh dear, it appears that the network uh, for Mr. Kofimino is failing us there. Uh, but um, he's actually making the point. But the issue about, do we have him back? Is that right? Yes, we lost you briefly. Uh, if you could wrap up on that, because there's a question also on youth unemployment, which has been cited, and what exactly we are doing to keep our youth busy is one of the issues that have also come up. Yeah. If, if there is one moment that Ghanaians can collectively, if citizens and not spectators, this is the time. This is the time that we have to work together to really rally behind our flag and protect our nation. We should protect our nation from the activities of this. Of this but what of this, really uh, are we uh, looking people. out for? Because Dr. Njidansu mentioned that, at least in one case that we've witnessed, they came very friendly and everything. So what really should we be looking out for is one of the issues that I want all of us uh, to point on and tell us. I, about. I think that one thing, one thing we must be looking out for is that every Ghanaian, every Ghanaian must, like, like I said, must shine his or her eye. Mm. If you live in a community, because definitely before they come in to commit this crime, they will come, survey, and do all the necessary groundwork. They will not just come just a day to come and commit whatever they want to commit. No, they will take time to study where people group, where people meet, where people undertake, you know, religious activities and all that. And so in our communities, if we see any unsuspecting characters, if we see people whose activities we, we really do not understand, immediately we must report to, to the security agencies for them to, to do whatever they have to do. You see, you may see a person being so nice. For instance, if you go to my village, everybody knows everybody. Mm. And so the very moment you come there, at least people will begin to know there is a stranger in town, and then they will begin to monitor your activities. This is the time we have to come together as Ghanaians to protect our land from the activities of this of this uh, uh, bad minded people. But, okay. but honorable, mm -hmm. uh, the most important thing in this aspect is not just merely mentioning that we should shine our eyes. There must be a conscious effort in making the people aware that we should shine our eyes in the first place. Again, our security agencies should not, should not actually work in silos. Mm -hmm. Intelligence is the biggest weapon against terrorism because they are always one step ahead of whatever you have. Look at the Nigerian army of close to about 200,000, and they cannot defeat Boko Haram of 3,500. It's because intelligence is not working properly, and uh, the corruption and other issues within the society are not making it possible for Boko Haram to be routed. So over here, if we want to shine our eyes, people must be made aware of terrorism, what I call mainstreaming terrorism. And you said one thing very importantly, they are not coming to kill one person and get the fame for it. Terrorism today thinks about lethality, how lethal they are, and they claim, uh, uh, they claim uh, 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 this thing for it. And then it's becoming more ideological in terms of religion, mm -hmm. more ideological. It's now cellular. There is no hierarchical order anymore that you know the head is Al-Qaeda here. Look at the West African sub-region. We have about six, eight of them differently. ISWAP, ISGS, Janim, you mentioned, and several of them, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. So we must be made, people must be made aware of such uh, modus operandi of the, of the terrorists. Other than that, we are all believing that, oh, security agencies are there. And if the security agencies are also working in silos, honorable, we are not going to get anywhere. Uh, Doc, if there is something I'll bring to the attention of our listeners, in fact, we have the focus center. That's right. Okay. The focus center has been going around the country trying to educate people That's on important. the need to be vigilant. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to we need to step up uh, or we need to do more. 
we need to do more. I agree perfectly well that we need to do more. School. So their, their, thing, their presence will be felt. We are told about schools, for instance, because the issue also is how lucrative this venture is. Very lucrative. Because once they get hold of our youth, it's very lucrative. Are we doing MFI. such that we can prevent that from happening? MFI, mm -hmm. there is something, again, I would like to draw our attention. If you look at the modus operandi of these characters, nano, especially what happened in Togo, there is something we really have to avert our minds to. They have now resorted to the use of IEDs, yes. improvised explosive, explosive devices. devices. Yes. If you look at what because happened in the Togo, they actually the constructed a secret minefield just to stall the reinforcement of the Togolese security forces. So these guys are getting more sophisticated by the day. I agree that we need to step up. Every Ghanaian, being it a child, middle-aged or old, must be educated on what to do, you know, in times like this. Because every the sub-region is at risk. Ghana is part of the sub-region. And so we are all at risk. And so I agree perfectly well that, yes, we must take the education to schools. We must take the education to our marketplaces. We must take the education to our churches, mosques, everywhere. We must all appreciate the fact that we are not in normal times. And so, yes, our antennas must be alert and working at all times. Okay. I let agree. me bring in, let me bring in Mukta and then uh, Mr. Lanchini Tobu on this uh, because uh, we've been talking about uh, the youth. We've been talking about our capabilities in terms of military awareness and how sophisticated these groups are. Uh, well, Mukta, you have been working on this. I'm sure you would want to touch on this youth unemployment, and uh, which has been cited as a major causal factor. You have a word or two on this, so we can take more questions on this. Well, yes, of course. Uh, if you look at the role of youth unemployment, it's a huge, huge thing in terms of its future and uh, extremist violence within the sub-region. Uh, many parts of the region, especially if you look at the Lake Chad Basin area, where youth frustrations and unemployment had been exploited and weaponized by these extremist groups. Our studies have shown that in many parts... Oh dear. Too bad. Oh, it appears Mukta's uh, network is just failing us on that. But Mr. Mr. Tobu, briefly, on uh, this um, the number of questions that we've received, youth unemployment, government's briefing you've been hearing uh, from the Deputy Defence Minister on it, they agree that we need to take it more down to the schools, more education on this particular activity of these extremist groups. Is that Tobo? Well. I'm so happy that the Deputy Minister, I'm so happy. Yes, can you hear me? Super, I can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Yes, I'm happy that the Deputy I'm happy to. Am I losing you? Your gadgets. My network. No, uh, I'm not sure they are attacking my network uh, today. <laughs> but maybe it's a good time to they, just bring in can. the next batch of questions. Yeah, let's get into the next batch of questions but while we, we work on the line. Start in this youth unemployment. Well, uh, you want to touch yes, on that yes. briefly, but let's get into the next right, batch. Sure. Yeah, if we have the next batch of questions, let's get into it. Then uh, we can. Uh, wrap up on this but uh, i see that we have this one also says from solace it says what level of collaboration is this between the military and the immigration service on the score given that the immigration service is usually the first you would encounter on the borders that's solace which one else do we have roger uh, we've taken roger but okay says there are those who say the ordinary ghanaian has not been informed enough to be on the lookout for signs and report to appropriate law enforcement agencies who takes the blame for that and how is that resolved more questions. As Sam says, the National Security Ministry had a bit of advice for churches to be on the lookout. Why the churches? Are churches a potential target? That's the concern. Chief, there are a lot of sophisticated weapons in the hands of civilians in the north, especially Boko. What is the state doing about that situation? Most of the youth in Boko especially know how to operate and handle weapons, making the situation delicate to the security agencies deployed in the area. What can be done on that aspect as well? Hashmin, car snatching has become widespread in the northern regions. What steps are being taken to fix that security threat for him? That's the concern. We have another. Uh, that I see one. Uh, it has a long preamble. Uh, that's from Mohamed Sani. 
uh, if we can add that quickly, then we can wrap up. Uh, as it is espoused in the case of Russia, Ukraine, annexation and aggression, almost every Ukrainian speaks a Russian language. For him, the question is, a language, is the language a new tool for conflict? Should Ghana be worried about parts of the Volta, Upper East and Western regions where most of our citizens speak French but are native Ghanaians? How do we as a country deal with the Boko conflict to deter terrorist invasion? And that's Mohamed Sani's question. He's a research and policy analyst. Maoli says, why is Ghana facing these threats at this time? What in our geopolitics could make us a target? Is it just our proximity to areas suffering extremism or something so peculiar? Uh, so a number of them. Maybe we start from the studio. At Yao, uh, who rectified our uh, lines on Zoom. Let's let's try uh, Mr. Lo Tobu, and then we can get into this batch of questions. Mr. Tobu, you are making a point. Yes, Emma, can you hear me? Very loud and clear, sir. You can go ahead. Did I lose you again? Great. What okay. I was saying that I'm happy the deputy minister the fact that terrorism is fine. And if terrorism, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Not too bad. Right. If terrorism is a crime, let's begin to look at how do we handle crime in Ghana. That is the fundamental thing. When police are getting investigated, we ag agree that prevention of crime is, is something that is so important in our national discourse. We need to prevent crime before we talk detecting it. We need to detect crime before we talk about investigating it. We need to investigate crime before, before we talk about prosecuting it. And the last phase of the criminal justice system is correctional centers. How are we correcting? There's a report from the Ghana Prison Service that says that about 80.3% of all people who had gone to jail from between 2015 and 2020 were under the age of 35. Mm -hmm. Our young people are being incarcerated. Our young people have the potential to be radicalized. What are we doing about that? So if you are talking about getting Ghanaians to be conscious of the threat of terror, we should be talking about a big concept of community policing, that the police must get, must get involved and let community get on board and let people be conscious. My experience in Israel showed so much that it is not the hard power of the Israel, of Israeli government that is of, of so much importance. It's the consciousness of the ordinary Israeli. I was in Israel in 2018 and with the national security minister, and he was telling us, Somebody drops a bag on the street. In less than three minutes, there's a report and the police are there. The citizens are so conscious. What are we doing to increase this consciousness of the Ghanaian people to the fact that terrorism is imminent? In reality, it is so close to us. It can happen anytime. But we should stand as a gun, as people to be conscious of this happening and be able to tell our people. So pastors, imams, all those people that are inviting, please, can we have a workshop for them? Can we get them the perspective, the real perspective of what is happening in West Africa? and get them into the picture. They should have to be co-opted and not co -opted. In coaching, we are trying to get them in, interested in the national outcome. What are we trying to achieve? We are trying to achieve peace. What are we trying to achieve? In a very volatile region, all we are doing is that every citizen of this country should understand that it's, it's imminent, attack, it's real, and what we do as a people is to let your child know that if you observe something that's untold, please report it. Okay. So if we are able to... In, Get community policing on board. It's not that what Dr. Dr. just described, like what happened in the church. People will be conscious of the fact that when they say close your eyes, in this era of terror attack, <laughs> please, it is better you close your eyes and, and speak to God because the <laughs> Well, <laughs> now let's get into. I don't know if Mukta is back, but let's get into uh, yes. this uh, batch of uh, questions. Mukta, right. I lost you uh, briefly uh, whilst you were making your point earlier, also on the issue about the youth unemployment, but we have. A number of questions now also on uh, sophisticated weapons in the hands of civilians in the north. Issues about language, language. Uh, also coming up. Um, uh, Mukta, briefly, if you can wrap up on your initial point, then we can get into this batch. Yeah, so the point was about the role of youth unemployment and violent extremism. In several parts of the West African sub-region, it appears uh, there seem to be many situations of anger oh no okay uh Mukta, sorry about that um <laughs> appears that that network is just not allowing us but uh with this batch um yeah, but i believe it's not the terrorists which issue, are. the terrorists are attacking his <laughs> network today okay well but uh, there's a uh, lot of sophisticated weapons they've talked about uh, in the north uh, the issues also about 
uh, whether the church is a potential target. We've been talking about that earlier. And then the ordinary Ghanaian not being informed enough. At least now we agree that we have to go down uh, to the schools and all. But the language and then sophisticated weapons in the hands of civilians. Right. Gun running in West Africa is a big problem. A big, big problem. It's one of the facilitating factors for terrorist activities. Where gun running is rife, the terrorists, actually terrorists love where there is that type of chaos. Transnational organized crimes are rife. Mm. You know, maritime crime, uh, other transnational organized crime like gun running, prostitution, uh, trafficking, and uh, human trafficking, etc., etc. All these things bode well for them. And so since in West Africa we have a lot of gun running activities, since the days of the Ghana, Guinea, Mali, Ghana, uh, Mali Songhai empires. Mm -hmm. Gun running has been very, very ripe. And it became worse after the overthrow of Gaddafi. So a lot of guns and That's again gone. the implosion of the Soviet Union and the demise of the of the Cold War created a condition where it's easy just to get arms. Um, AK-47 that should sell at about $350 will now sell in West Africa for $50. And so there is a lot of gun running in West Africa, which is also a very basic crime, but also profitable uh, uh, venture. And so that is very important. That is one of the things uh, that is, we talk of language, yes. Obviously, there is this Accra initiative mm -hmm. in which about five countries have been able to put their resources together and thinking about integrated border management. But that's not just enough. Integrated border management is where you have a common border. It's like between Ghana and Togo. I think they have built a new border post, which is yeah. not being used. That's why you have one-stop shop kind of thing. So Ghanaian officials and Togo officials will be working together. And that would also mean that we have to change the way we do things. And I've suggested this at a forum quite recently. In that forum, at that forum, I suggested that no person may be employed in our security agencies, especially border management agencies, where they are not bilingual. Mm. At least that should be French exactly. and English. Okay. French and English. Okay. And from the other side also, the same French and English. Okay. It will become easier for them to work together in an IBM, that is Integrated Border Management. That's, if we start doing it now in the next four or five years, you see our border managers very good at uh, French and English, and they will be able to stop most of the crimes okay. that are coming in and allow more trade to, to, uh, to go. So mm. language is good. It's, it's a weapon against terrorists. Mm. Because if they behave in the way that they have their counterparts in another country where they can easily speak to, and you have border agents also able to understand the language, is very, very important. Mm. You know? And I think there was a question about the proximity. Yeah. But the proximity, I'll take it on two fronts. With proximity, the terrorists will need a place uh, of proximity, one, as a haven. Initially, my thoughts are that Ghana will not be attacked the way Burkina has been attacked because the socio-historical specificities are, are not the same. There are more unresolved communal differences historically in Burkina than in Ghana. And therefore, the West African, uh, what do you call it, ISIS, and they have made that place a haven to stay and help exacerbate those conflicts. In Ghana, we have those conflicts, but it hasn't come to a point where the proximity says that they would rather need Ghana as a haven where they can, as the minister said, rush in and go out, come in and okay. go, come in and go, that kind of thing. And that's what we should be careful about. Other than that, if within the proximity that we're talking about, they are able to get friends like uh, dollar power, and they stay, when they stay, they expand their territory, and they are a force to reckon with. And it's very, even dollar power, we have not been able to conquer them. How much more ISWAP in West Africa gets the place as a... This mm. is, I okay, let, let me bring in um, Mr. Menu uh, on this. I've seen uh, the question earlier about the implementation of the national security strategy. I'm told uh, you haven't really uh, touched on that uh, for us. And then also the sophisticated weapons in the hands of civilians. Is there really something we're doing uh, specifically about that situation that you'd want to speak to? I'm sure Chief uh, is asking. And then generally also Ghanaians seem to be taking care of their own security needs because they don't trust in the national security services what does this mean for our democracy? Eric is also asking. Well, for that, that will be a worry if, if Ghanaians do not trust institutions mandated to really provide security for this nation. Clearly, that, that really will be a worry. I think we must begin to trust our institutions and believe that they can execute the mandate that our own constitution 
as giving them. If, if we say we do not trust them, for me, I, I, it gives me a lot of headache. I will talk about the sophisticated arms in, in the hands of um, citizens. Again, I mean, for this, is, this is a worrying situation. And Doc rightly said that these uh, groupings really, uh, their activities flourish in areas where we have some problems. And so if you go to our own Boko, where there's the, you know, the issues in Boko started with chieftaincy and all that, I can confidently tell you that as we speak now, the issues in Boko, for me, is not really that of chieftaincy. Now criminals have taken over, and these criminals are using sophisticated arms. You see some of these are uh, uh, extremists and terrorists. And MFA, if you see the kind of things they use, you will marvel. Some of them use rocket propelled grenades yes. mm. and heavy weapons. Th this is serious. Where do they get Where them are from? They getting precisely the point. Now, Doc mentioned dollar power. And you know, that is why, for me, our fight against Galamse is so important. Yeah. Because if you have ever been to a Galamse site, you appreciate some of the things we are talking about, where you go and people are fully armed with AK-47 and other sophisticated and just, is the idea just to protect what they are doing? You do not even know who and who. Doc rightly mentioned dollar power. Go to dollar power and see the kind of galamse going on as a measure to, to really, you know, I, I'll tell you a funny thing. Dollar power is not really accessible. Mm. Yes. It's not accessible. Yes. When I assumed office as, as a deputy minister, I was to visit dollar power. And you know what? I was to go with two helicopters. So whilst one is down, one will be up. I and mean, in fact, that was not a joke. Y you understand? The place is not accessible. Government is now making sure that all these places will be accessible. And so henceforth, we are going to put the 48th Engineer Regiment to very effective and good use so that it can open up all these places so we can, you know, assess these places to deal with the situation on, on our hands. Well, just, uh, think, just so we wrap up, it's almost time for us to go. But the concern is we have not been able to win the fight against terrorism. How then are we sure, what is the assurance that we can be able to fight terrorism um, as we are talking about now? MFA, one thing Galamse, is for I should sure. say, Galamse. Uh, we've not been able to win the fight against Galamse. Galamse is what I'm talking about. Precisely How are we point. able to do this when it comes to terrorism? Precisely the point. That is why I mentioned the fact that we as a country now, if we need to come together as citizens and not spectators, this is the time. We have to come together. No one person can do this. But collectively, I believe that we can we can achieve or fight or need these activities in the back. And so it, it, is, it is an issue or a problem where we all have to have the mind set to really fight to succeed. If we don't, then our countries, trust me, will be overrun by this, 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 this criminals. Mm. There is one thing, uh, I think somebody mentioned something with regards to churches. Yes, and whether they are really obvious. a target. Mm -hmm. It is obvious that these people, you know, undertake their activities in areas where you have a, a congregation of, 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 of a huge number of people. And of course, sometimes when you go to a church service on, on Sundays, you know, you have a good number of people there. And that is what, if they are able to strike such a place, then they will get attraction the that they want to. So it's not just the churches, but um, you know, malls and all that are places that we have to be on the on the lookout. Okay. Well, I give the final word to you. It appears that Mokta and Peter Lanch in these lines, they have failed us um, at the latter part. But just before we go, uh, Dr. Nchidanso, the issue about the real threat and uh, what each of us have to do uh, to be able to fight this. Terrorism is a reality. It's not going to die today. In fact, we are in a century of terrorism. West Africa is so rife for terrorism. Mm -hmm. As I said, 70% of all terrorist uh, activities in Africa is in West Africa. 
now they have been able to capture almost all the countries around us. Mm -hmm. If they capture any uh, coastal country, they link up with the maritime terrorists also. And it's a global thing. It's a global phenomenon. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we must really understand that it is not peculiar to say West Africa and therefore we think that, we oh. can, yeah. And then we can't say also that <laughs> Ghana is uh, an island. We have this, we have that. The threat no, we, is real. The Thank threat you is so real. much. We'll have to leave it here, Dr. Andrew Dan. So I'm sure that this is not examinable. I must declare <laughs> that uh, that's my lecturer, Mehade <laughs> Gafsti. Thank many thanks uh, for your company tonight. Dr. Andrew Dan, so has been my guest. We had uh, Kufia Mankwame, the Deputy Defense Minister, Mukta Mumuni Mukta also joining us. And then also Peter Lanchini Tobo. I'm grateful for your time, gentlemen. For radio audience, a walk with Jesus is up next. Please stay. I am MFR Paul. There's more when you log on to myjoyonline.com.